I am a dance teacher, singing teacher, freelance writer, actor. Um, and I'm here, I used to work in schools a lot. Um, so I was a chaplain, a youth worker, and a singing teacher in high schools and primary schools. Yeah. <laughs> and youth centers. And I think that's about it. Sounds nice, about right. Nice. Yeah, and then that's me. So would you categorize yourself as like a like a like a youth worker um, in the previous life and now you're a yeah. more a um, all rounder? Yeah, definitely yeah, I think that youth worker is probably the best way to phrase it. Um, and now I've gone back to my creative roots, I think, and using that to kind of yeah, be creative. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll get straight into it. Um, and Let's do it. and I'm going to use that bit to kind of bring it back into uh, everything that I want to talk about here. Because mm. it's, it's the dancing, the singing, the acting. Yeah. It's, uh, it takes a lot of nerves to do that. Whoa. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see how we can um, bring it all into what we're going to talk about. So um, we're doing a middle school kind of roundup today. Yes. So uh, in particular, the year nine mm. side of things. And year nine is a point where I see or I've seen kids kind of, that's the main major turning point in mm. this generation. When I was at school, because we didn't have year seven, um, it would have been probably year 10 as the kind of turn. Yeah. And now it's year nine, nine. because of the year sevens. Um, so you start high school, year seven, um, you're scared, you're unsure, and then mm. towards the end of the year, you, you get a bit confident. You're, bit, you're like, oh, this isn't too bad. I've, yeah. I've done it, I've survived. And then year eight is interesting because those year sevens are now like, oh, we know what high school's like, and yeah. we've got some younger kids. Yeah, there's someone smaller than us yeah, in the school yeah, now. Yeah, we're no longer rookies. So, um, year eight's more like trying to solidify what they know and, and mm. kind of grow on it, but all at the same time, they become a little bit more cheeky and they're a little bit more um, rebellious and yeah. they've kind of sussed out the system. Um, year nine is more a uh, expansion on that again, but then the magic happens where puberty Yes, <laughs> and that's when um, mood that's swings. when yeah mood swings and um, a lot of drama happens. Yeah, and the boys start liking the girls and vice versa, and all these relationship things and um, a, a lot more. And in, in this day and age, it's more social media, yes. um, like hard social media, and I see a lot more bullying online. Yeah, as you get older. Um, and a lot more bullying outside of the social media as well as you get older. Um, exclusions, um, yeah. which is probably one of the main types of bullying that I've seen where they would just lose or they disband friends or they kick them out of their group, have falling out. And yeah, that's, that's that side of things. Yeah. But tell me about your school history, your, your personal days at school oh my i have quite a bizarre schooling experience um so i went to a little school that did pre-primary through to year 12. um it was tiny so when i was in year 12 there were four of us in my year 12 graduating class we were just like really little so i just i never um well i still experienced a lot of the you know, things that kids and teenagers do, it was just in a very odd setting. So it's kind of like if you didn't get along with your year group, you just didn't have a good time. You didn't have a good time at all. So where, where, where are you from? Kwinana. Kwinana. Yeah. Tiny little school in Kwinana, which has been kind of, I don't know the legalities, but it's been revamped and yeah. taken over. Kwinana, and, that sounds like too close to the city to be such a small school. Too close to the city? Yeah. Oh. Uh, like I was thinking yeah. country. No, no. Yeah. So it was like, at that time, it was partnered with the the local church. So it was kind of like a little, I guess, shoot off of the church. Was there. it a private school? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, I mean, I didn't enjoy school. I was 
undiagnosed ADHD until like my final semester of uni. So I just thought I was didn't have the attention span for it. So I really struggled to pay attention. I got really frustrated a lot. I was your typical smash out your homework and assignments the night before it's due kind of person. <laughs> yeah, I, I honestly think that I have it as well. Um, I don't know how severe or how mild, probably more than mild, but I think it's like a like a dial that just, I think that's what that is anyway. Yeah. But yeah, um, so your, your Quinana days, when, what year did you graduate? 2010. 2010, so yeah. you're two years um, younger than me. I, I grew up in Kalgoorlie, full, oh, full, really? yeah, full six years of school. My entire high school life was in Kalgoorlie and that was brutal. Because back yeah. then, um, and the school that I went to, the public school, um, it was just like um, everyone for themselves in yeah. a way. Now there are schools that I've taught at that have been actually pretty, pretty bad. Um, in terms of behaviour management, um, my school from Kalgoorlie, from memory, there was a there was a fair bit of bullying. There was a fair bit of like nonsense. Yeah. But, but I kind of grew out of it because I was naturally taller. <laughs> so they, yeah. So they they, kind of, they didn't really pick on me, but at the same time, there was um, a few groups of kids not trying to pick any specific uh, um, group. In particular, but um, yeah, they, they would like come in, come in uh, like squads to pick on you and stuff yeah. like that. Um, and yeah, but, but what about yourself in Kwinana? So, um, what year do you think was the hardest for you at school? Probably around um, that. I found year 11 really hard. Um, academically, year 11 and 12 I found the hardest, but socially I think that year 6 to year 9, like year 10 was my favourite year. Yeah, so It was when everyone just chilled out, yeah. it was kind of like, hey we don't get along that well, whatever, I'm going to go hang out with this group, yeah. just get along with them, whereas previous to that it had been quite nasty. Um, I've since found out, because some of these people I've kind of reconciled with and we, like, we're not best mates but we talk and, you know, um, but other people just really casually dropped to me that in primary school they had a We Hate Britney club that I didn't know about. Um, and I, being the hyperactive uh, extrovert that I am, didn't know what this club was and I was like, hey, can I join your new club? And they're like, yeah, and then they had to make a We Hate Britney Club part two because I joined the We Hate Britney Club not knowing what it was. Um, so I wasn't always well liked. Um, I didn't like to get in trouble. I stayed out of trouble. I was scared of getting in trouble. I was quite anxious. So they all thought I was like, you know, the good kid, but really I just didn't want to get, like, if I got in trouble, I would have an anxiety attack. So I just yeah. stayed out of trouble, but it created this complex of like oh you're just the teacher's pet when really I just didn't uh, want to get in trouble so um, they had a they assumed they assumed um <laughs> Sabine just pointed to herself saying that was her oh really <laughs> it sucks hey <laughs> and then you get awards for being so well behaved and it makes it worse and you're like I just don't want to get in trouble <laughs> yeah I feel that <laughs> so yeah so you're so you're getting in, <clears throat> you're wanting to avoid a problem with the school, mm. but then this was causing a problem with the students. Yeah. And um, from, so that was the first bit. We went straight into it, exclusion. Yeah. That was the first bit of bullying. Was there anything else that came from that? Yeah, I think a lot of things. I mean, um, I wasn't an angel. I would say and do things in retaliation that weren't nice either. Um, you know, I think you also go through a, a, quite a normal stage of trying to figure out who you are and how you're gonna react to these things. But I always felt really terrible and I would have to go the next day and be like, I'm so sorry that I said that to you. I'm like, and I needed them to forgive me. Otherwise I would just, that's that anxiety coming through and needing, like being a people pleaser and, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, as I got older, I mean, I was, I was head girl. I mean, there were four of us to pick from. Uh, well, they called it school captain because there were only four of us, and they're like, well, we don't really need a head boy and head girl. Was it so, like, uh, was it like two boys, two girls? Yeah. Or, oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, 
while everyone, all four of us are, are nice people, we didn't necessarily all get along. Um, but that's really normal when you throw four strangers bye, <laughs> um, together and you know, it's like, well, be friends because there's no one else. So I kind of just spent a lot of my time in year 11 and 12 in the library. I just kind of sat there at lunchtime and worked on assignments and, but um, yeah, I think that again added to people not loving me because I became a school prefect and I became a school, you know, sport captain and whatever. And yeah. it just added to that level of... This day and age, that's like glorified. Everyone loves the, the school captain and the prefect, and from what I see anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and this day and age, they, they're more confident in being like, well, I'm, 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 I've got the school captaincy or whatever. And I've got the, got all the confidence and do, yeah. do what I do. Love and, it. Um, you feel like the lack of students in your school was a part of it, or? Mm. I think a huge part of it um, was also really. Um, uh, I mean, we didn't use the normal school curriculum yeah. for most of the time. So I changed into what we would call, you know, the standard school curriculum in year 10 was when they phased that in and put it through the school. Previous to that, we sat in these little cubicles, you know, in like American movies when you see them, we literally had these little cubicles. We weren't allowed to talk to our peers during class time, otherwise you got demerit straight away. Three demerits are under tension. You do not communicate with your peers, which is, a terrible system with all the research that we have about social learning and everything. Yeah. So it was a homeschooling system and they tried to use it for school. So everybody, when you came into the school, you did a test in different subjects to say which level you're at. So you wouldn't come in and be a year seven and then do year seven level work. You would come in and do a test and they're like, okay, well you're at this level. And that was the books that you did and you worked through it yourself. And if you needed help, you had to put up a little flag and wait for the teacher to come to you. But imagine having a class of years, because it was so small, years fours to sixes or eights in one room, all of them, even in the same year group, they're all doing different subjects at the same time. They're doing different levels of the subjects at the same time. So you've got to teach them individually. There was no standing up the front. And so- Sounds like, sounds like my class sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, yeah, that is challenging. So, and it was also, I mean, it was called, I uh, won't say what it was called just in case, but um, it was a Christian based education. So, a lot of it was very, um, you know, the science subjects were quite, um, you know, non believers believe in evolution, uh, yeah. but we believe in this. Yeah. So, by the time you kind of hit your 10, and like for me, the school was just phasing it out. I've got friends who did it right through yeah. year 12, but for us, they were like, hmm, this system isn't working, <laughs> let's try and phase it out. So, all of a sudden, I'd gone from doing that from pre primary to year, then year nine, thrown in year 10 into a classroom with my peers, and it's like, okay, let's discuss ideas. <laughs> and it's like, oh, what? <laughs> so, yeah, it was quite, so you throw all those different things together, I think, and then a tiny small group, a uh, peer group, yeah. it's kind of setting up, I think, for a lot of conflict. What was the biggest like takeaway that you got from middle school, year, year eight to year nine, or even to year 10? To year 10? Um, for me, I think I would summarize it by, have you seen The Greatest Showman? Such, there's a quote in The Greatest Showman uh, which summarizes it really well, and it's just, um, you don't need everybody to love you, just a few good people. And um, I think that was probably my biggest thing that I'm still learning to this day, but in that, those few years in particular, yeah. was you don't need the whole school to love you, you just yeah. need a few good friends, you just need a few good people. And did you have that? I did, in year 10 and 11 I did, by year 12 not so much. How did you obtain it in year 10? How did you obtain that friendship? So we're talking about um, creating friends. Mm. Well, I was quite insecure and I thought that nobody liked me and I know that there were issues with that, but I kind of took 20 seconds of courage to approach a group that seemed like, uh, we'd seen them around the school and they were all laughed a lot and got along really well. Kind of just approached them one day and said, is it okay if I sit with you? 
at lunch and they were like, yeah, of course. And then just slowly started sitting with them, having, you know, started talking to them and over time we became good friends and we ended up with a nice group and, and yeah. And what happened? And then they left, they went to TAFE, some did apprenticeships, um, year 11 started <laughs> and yeah, it kind of kept in contact with them but it wasn't the same not having them at school, so. So, um, this is a good question for the young kids, because um, this can relate to when you go to high school for mm. the first time. How, um, how did you adapt to not having friends um, all of a sudden again? Mm. So, I um, was very active in clubs outside of school. So, I had that as a constant through it all. So I did dancing, I know some friends of mine did basketball, um, whatever it was, I kind of had my constant, even when it did all get thrown in the air in school in that first term, I still had that constant on, you know, Monday, Wednesday nights. I knew I was going to go and see my dancing friends. And then in school, I mean, it was hard and it was quite lonely, but I also spoke to some of my teachers and we had a high school chaplain. And I sat down with them and I just told them, said, I'm feeling really lonely. I've, my mates have gone. I don't know what to do. And um, they were really good to just sit and have a vent and a laugh with. But they also were really good at kind of saying, you know, watching from the outside and going, well, what about this person? Have you ever thought of kind of approaching them? And, you know, you can hang out with, just because you're in year 11, doesn't mean you can't be mates with the year 10s. Like, you know, is there anyone in that group? And I was kind of like, oh, yeah. oh, okay, you know, and I'll open my eyes a bit. And it took a while, but it still kind of worked out in the end. And yeah, oh, it always works out. Yeah. It's all, it's all learning. It's all just part of the learning process. I, um, when I was in year 10, I had friends, um, but I started doing my own thing in a way where um, it was, I was, I turned extrovert quickly. Um, during high school <laughs> and then and then I had friends in year eight and that's like back then it's like what are you doing with year eight so like two years younger than you and now it's like you know standard you know Sabine she's 25 she's four years younger than me you know you get older you mature it doesn't matter mm. but like um, I would be like the anti-bully kind of vigilante <laughs> at year 10 because I, I just like for some reason I just had empathy yeah for all the, for all the geeky kids for all the for all the kids with disabilities, um, and for all the, the weird kids that were considered like just out of the norm, mm. and I, I had I don't know how I had that, but I think it's just yeah I, I couldn't pinpoint a moment where I was like you know what I really don't accept accept this. Mm. I remember one specific time in year ten in the schoolyard, it was at lunchtime. This kid he was he was uh, he had something like he had a disability. And he'd be walking around doing his own thing, mm. like not bothering anyone, or yeah. walking around like you know out away, you know, just like looking around with his yeah. bag. And some kid went and like tackled him, like just out of nowhere tackled him. Yeah. And I let him know about it. Like I absolutely went to town. Like I didn't beat him up or anything, but we like I had like a couple of friends, and we like sorted him out. Like we were like, this is not good. You yeah. Know? We need more of that at school. Um, yeah. And there's not enough of that. And like exclusion and stuff, it happens so much mm. at school. And you know, um, like you said, you went to the library um, through through your final years of school. Do you, would, what would you tell year 11, year 12 Brittany now if you spoke to her? What would you tell her? Chill out. <laughs> Chill out? Um, no, I think I would, I don't know. I think I'd let her know it's going to work out all right and not to stress so much about grades um, I think as well like you know I definitely think there's a level of putting in that hard work and you do you try your best but also understanding that ATAR isn't the end of the world I'm not sure if that's what it's still called but you know I was so anxious and stressed about getting a bad ATAR score that I just didn't retain information and I probably closed myself off a lot to other people as well without realising I was doing it because I was just stressed and when 
I'm stressed, I shut down. So there could have been a huge level of people not feeling like I was approachable as a friend because I was just in my head all the time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and I do think, you know, I'm all for try your best and, and do what you can, but also understanding that, yeah, that that test at the end of year 12, those that, that score, it's not gonna make or break your life or life. your career. Not, yeah. Like, there's so many other ways into doing what it is that you dream about doing. Um, yeah, it's not all dependent. Like I got a terrible ATAR score. I was so stressed. And back then, I don't know what it's like now, 10 years later. Um, I, Cause I, my, my subjects were largely the creative fields. It was media and English and drama and they were considered easy subjects. So Very even well. though I got really high scores on those, got scaled really badly. And then in my weaker subjects like maths and science, I didn't get as high a score, so overall my entire yeah. score came down. But I got I got accepted into Notre Dame Uni before they looked. They didn't look at my score. They I got in based on um, my reports, and my reports said you know things like even though my scores weren't the highest, Brittany always tries her best. She's a delight to have in class. That's exactly and, what I try to teach the kids at school. Yeah, well, right. I, I got in first round offer before the ATAR scores got announced. I got a letter from Notre Dame saying, based on your portfolio and your school reports, we'd love to offer you a place. And I was like, cool. And then I got my score and it was terrible. And I was like, I'm so glad they didn't look at this because I wouldn't have gotten in. Um, yeah, there's just so many other ways. And even if, you know, I don't work in the field that I got my degree in. Um, which I think is really common. I started one degree, didn't like it, moved over, did another one, worked in that field for two years, and then just thought I, do, I got quite unwell, thought I don't have the energy to do it, and I miss doing the creative field, and I've gone back to writing and acting and dancing and singing. And You're trying different things still, that's fine. Yeah, still figuring out what I want to do 10 years later. Yeah. Like, I, I didn't what do I want to do, do when I grow up? I didn't even do ATAR. <laughs> Oh man, I wish I hadn't. <laughs> I started I started year eleven yeah. with chemistry, physics, GNT, which is geometry, trigonometry, which mm. is actually one of my favourite subjects now. Um, but I I failed it. I was it was hard yeah. for me. And then um, uh, calculus, so like all the engineering things, because yeah. I wanted to do mining engineering. Yeah. My mum said you should do mining engineering. She didn't say you will do mining engineering, she said you should. should. She was like guiding me, she's like, this is good, yeah. learn Kalgoorlie. <coughs> and um, that's what happened. I got sucked in. But because my mum was more about my happiness mm -hmm. and she was a fair person and she didn't uh, she didn't want me to live through her eyes, which yeah, is I'm super that's thankful so for. Great. Um, that was the difference. Because yeah. I see a lot of kids now that they're, they're living to, to impress their parents. Yeah. You know, but um, I halfway through year eleven, I bombed out. I was like, nah, that's it. Mm. I'm doing. I'm going back to general. And I mean, from memory, I still had to hustle. Mm. Like English, never my best subject. I don't write. Mm. I wish I could write. I've got so many things to, to write about. I wish I could count. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the thing. Like I find that girls are more of the um, the artsy side. And the boys are more of the kind of science yeah. math side. Like, don't quote me or anything, but yeah, that's I do that's know like a few. Average. A few of my my girlfriends have. Um, I do feel like that's you know stereotypical as it sounds. It is, it stereotypical, is yeah. quite common. Yeah. But then every now and then someone full on shocks you. Like, um, a oh, yeah, few good friends of mine, yeah. females. They they were the ones who did like. Um, you know, chemistry and all yeah. those subjects, and got like 96 on yeah. their ATAR. I'm like, at the end of the day, though, <laughs> at the end of the day, you, you got to work to your strengths. Yeah, and that's it. I think find find what you're passionate about. Like I always knew I grew up dancing, singing. Like all I wanted to do was musical theatre, but I was so scared of getting rejected that I didn't try. Because I was like, if I don't get into the course that I really want to do, then my dream is completely dead. Whereas so if I how don't did you do it. That? Well, I worked in another field for 10 years, <laughs> got really sick, spent about two months in and out of hospital, two or three months in and out of hospital, and just went, you know what? Life, like, is just too 
fleeting. Like, where did the past 10 years go? Um, I'm just gonna try. Like, if I fail, I fail. I'm gonna keep going. And I changed my idea of what success was. I think being younger, I was very like, the only way to be a successful singer was to be a famous singer. You know, the only way to be a successful actor was to be in like an Avengers film or something. Whereas now, my idea of success is very different. Me, like I'm always working harder to go to the next level, but to me, doing something that you enjoy, that's being successful. Being kind to people in your field and helping them reach their goals, that's successful. So I'm really happy and I love my job because I get to um, help younger people realise their dreams and fight for their dreams while still fighting for mine and not letting that go and you know I already think I'm I've made it because I'm not I don't care about everybody knowing my name I care about doing what I enjoy and then helping other people along the way so awesome. yeah I think that changed it a lot so now if I get rejected which happens all the time you go for auditions and you don't always get the role and it, like it's not you know, earth shattering anymore. Yeah. It's not a reflection of, oh, I'm not good enough. It's just, all right, that wasn't for me, that's fine. Another door will open and I'll just keep trying. And, you know, it happens and it's good fun. That's awesome. I'm going to continue on that, but for now, we're going to take a break after these few messages. With your, with your definition of success, mm. that's been part of my kind of process at the moment. Um, teaching kids mm. what the de definition of success is. I had one kid the other day message me on Instagram and said, um, you're so successful and all this and, and I want to be successful too. And mm. I said, and I said, what's your definition of success? Mm. And they said to, you know, set a goal and achieve it, that's success. And then I said to them, what happens then? Mm. You, what do you do after that? And the, they kind of didn't understand it, but um, what I'm trying to say is, once you succeed a goal, once you achieve a goal, and you think you're successful, you're going to want to do something else. Like yes. you hit it, you hit a thousand followers, a million followers, and um, uh, whatever, or maybe you, you get your dream job. Are you successful? And that's the thing, like. Uh, it's the difference between the two goals. So if yeah. you succeed at your goal and then you're gonna set another goal, what happens in between those two goals? Are you successful between those between two those, goals? Yeah. And if you don't hit that second goal sooner than you expected, you're not gonna feel like you're successful anymore. Yeah. And if that's the case, then that means you're um, you're not really doing exactly what you love, potentially. Yeah. And you may lose interest because you, you know, you're grinding it and you're, mm. you're, you're having to do it, not yeah. wanting to do it. I found that with music for a long time um, because I write a lot and um, felt like I was putting so many hours into writing and practicing and performing and sharing and I just, you know, would look at the, instead of having an end product and going, wow, I'm really proud of that. I put so much hard work into that. I'm really happy with the end goal. It was like, oh, only a hundred people have listened to it. Oh, I worked so hard and nobody's gonna, nobody cares. So you're creating it now for yourself. And now I do it for myself. And it's like getting to share that with other people. That's just part of the joy of it. And if people watch it and they enjoy it, then awesome. And it's if they don't like, oh well, I'm going to keep doing it for the rest of my life because I love it. I love to do it. And um, yeah, and I, I think... And how has that progressed? Well, I've definitely found doors are opening a lot more without me. Like I'm still looking and I still apply for things, but I'm getting a lot of these cool opportunities that I would have loved 10 years ago. Um, but I felt like, you know, could never get them and then all of a sudden when I shifted the focus I found that the right people were coming to me anyway and going hey we noticed that you um, you know you're really good at this and I had someone recently approach me send me a message online and say hey we're just a small film company um, we need a cover of this song for our film we've, we've heard you sing heard your videos would love it if you could record a copy for us and I was like yeah of course you know and 
all of a sudden, I think when you're putting out that positive energy and letting people know that you're open to it, still trying your best, but just not trying to force it, you know, and not being focused on getting the views and getting like the sales as much. Yeah, let it happen. It, yeah, it does happen. And I think like what you were saying about success, like what happens in between when you reach that first goal, that time in between, I think if you're not careful, you end up forgetting to actually live life. You spend your whole life, I don't, you know, trying to get things done. Like you spend, you're so busy doing life that you forget to actually live and enjoy it. And, um, and that's when your creativity gets stuck as well. Like when I'm trying to force a song, writing a song, that's when it's rubbish. That's the same with my photos, same with my videos. I, you know, I got sucked in for a little while, you know, to, to like get more engagement because it was happening, it was happening. I was yeah. like, and it was unexpected. I was like, oh my God. And then I kept telling myself, don't, don't get too, you know, yeah. um, ahead of yourself. And that voice in my head saved me because now it's like on the kind of quiet mm. and it's happening to other creators as well. Mm. And they're complaining about it. Like I can see all of them like whinging about it. Like their engagement's going down and the algorithms are changing and stuff. It's like, ooh, what's, that, what's gonna happen? And I'm just there like, what are you doing it for? Yeah, yeah. What are you doing it for? What are you, what's, yeah. what's your aim? What's your, your goal? end goal? Yeah. Like, for, for me, what that says is their end goal is to get as many followers as they can, to, <coughs> excuse me, to get as many sponsors as they can, yeah. to make as much money, money. as they can. That's, yeah. that's what I see. For me, it's like, let it happen. Yeah. Someone will approach Definitely. me one day, or maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, the best thing about it is I just enjoy making the videos. Yeah. And Worst case, it's practice for 10 years time when the next platform comes out. Yeah, so, that's it. And you just have yeah. to remember that, um, you know, ebbs and flow, it's gonna happen. Yeah. You know, it's part of it. Yeah. You know, any any singer, any artist that you look at, creative, they, they go through quieter times. It's just yeah. how the industry goes. And it's if you don't have a clear idea in your head why you're there, and you don't have that genuine love and passion for what you're doing in whatever field, you're gonna burn out. And um, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I think just keep hustling, keep like, in, if make sure you reassess why am I doing what am I doing, what I'm doing, and you're not gonna love it every day. There are gonna be days when you're like, oh my gosh, this is doing my head in, and that's all right. Like, take a break, talk to a mate, ask for help, like. I'm a huge um, mental health advocate. I think asking for help and normalizing therapy is a really huge thing happening at the moment. And I love it. I'm all yeah, for it. I've seen a lot more therapy. Like I sometimes, like I talk to Sabine. Yeah. All, every day, obviously, but um, she's studying her psychology stuff and she's actually pretty good. And That's she's amazing. so helpful. Yes, um, love it. And like, she doesn't give me like a, like a, Oh, it's okay, dear. It's all right. Like She'll she's be right. straight out, straight out, straight out. Like that's my job. Like, mm. That's that's what I learned. That uh, I mean, this may sound stereotypical, but the the females, that's what they want to hear. Like it's more like a vent. It's gonna be okay. Vent. Don't solve the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was my that was one of my biggest learnings last year. Because every time Sabine had something um, come up, I'd be like, okay, this let's do this, let's it. do this, let's do this, and that wasn't the key. But yeah. in reversal that's what I want I want mm. I want like a second opinion I want to mm. I want someone to challenge my thoughts or expand on them yeah and that's what therapy does so yeah did you did you like talk about therapy mm. because I feel that teachers are therapists in a, in a way did you feel that you were supportive from the teachers at school like in which way me to them or them to me then to you yeah I was really lucky. Um, I worked in one particular school for three years. And no, no, when you were a student. Oh, when I was a student, um, oh, they tried to be. I think ten years ago, we weren't talking about mental health as openly as we are now. Um, I things like I got, I say caught out. It's not the right way to phrase it, but teachers called on is a better way to say it that I wasn't eating. Um, they kind of were noticing that I was retreating a lot and as a very 
I'd always been a very loud, talkative person and all of a sudden I wasn't talking to anyone, I was keeping to myself and um, they definitely tried to help but I don't think that the they were quite equipped at the time. So things like, you know, we noticed that you're not eating so they gave my folks a call which was great and they just let them know, hey we've noticed she's not eating but it kind of just stopped there. And um, it was kind of like, they said to me, they didn't say anything. It was like, oh, we're gonna go do some grocery shopping. What do you want for lunches? And we kind of did things like that. And a lot of it we realize now was because I had anxiety and I didn't know what anxiety was. I didn't know how to articulate it. It was killing my appetite, made me feel really sick, made me feel nauseous. So I didn't want to eat anything because I already felt really sick. And um, so, I think they tried, but yeah, I just don't think that the they were as well equipped as what I hope we are now. <laughs> and, and and what do you hope they are now? Like, what are you expecting, or what do you what do you think teachers are now like? My experience in primary schools, because I worked in as a chaplain in primary schools, is that um, there are a lot teachers are really clued on, and they notice. They notice with their students. They spend a lot of time with them, you know. Um, they notice when something shifts, and a lot of the time they would come and talk to me um, and go, "This is what we've noticed. What do you think?" Yeah. Me being the chaplain, not a psychologist or a, or a counselor, would say, "Hey, I'm I'm happy to come in and help out, but you know, do you think maybe we should consult? We'll keep an eye on it. We'll consult with the the psych." And I had a really good working relationship with our school psych, so I could run things past her and go. We've, uh, they've told me this and they were able to kind of direct us a bit more and um, so and there are a lot of prog cool programs now like uh, the drumbeat program um, there's rhythm to recovery which I'm trained in and I love which is like those bongo drums yeah. and you sit in the circle and it was just fun. I did a session with the teachers once and just went, all right, we're going to sit down and take out our frustration on the drums. Oh, there's and so like, much more support these It was days. so yeah. great. Yeah. Like So many different activities they can yeah. do. They're inventing, which is cool. And we talk about mindfulness and um, a trick that I wish I'd known earlier that my counsellor, because I still see a counsellor, I think it's great. I think you don't have to have something going on in your life to go and talk to someone. Like, um, But something she taught me for anxiety was that the first thing that goes out the window when you're feeling anxious or overwhelmed is your breathing. You start, a lot of people, I hold my breath without realizing I'm doing it. A lot of people, your heart rate speeds up and it actually starts to shut down the function in your brain that you reason with. So she was like, there's no point in sitting there when you're anxious trying to reason with yourself. The first thing you need to do is start doing taking deep breaths. She was like, and then start reasoning with yourself. It's such a simple little thing. And it worked for you? Oh, it worked wonders. When I start to feel my heart race, I'm like, okay, you know, deep breath in, deep breath, get that under control and then start doing your logic. Sometimes things happen and it escalates quicker and it, you know, you need something more and I kind of have like a little action plan of about, you know, so what would your action plan be for a year nine? For a year nine, depends on the person. <laughs> depends on what it is. But if you're feeling anxious or you're feeling stressed, overwhelmed, whatever it is, my go-to is always talk to an adult that you trust, whether it's your teacher, a parent, an older sibling, whoever it is, talk to an adult that you trust. Um, don't be afraid of asking for help. Like, it's okay. You're not What's a burden. What's the worst that can happen? Yeah, honestly, I think, you know, so many people, I know I did, I was like, I don't want people to stress about me. I don't want to burden anyone. People would rather know and be able to help you out than not know and you to suffer alone. Um, so ask for help, talk to an adult that you trust, um, take deep breaths. And um, that would be like my first three things, I think, yeah. Ask, well, two, my two main things, take deep breaths, ask some for help Excellent. Um, and they'll they can help you come up because there's lots of things that you can do like action plans look like lots of different things for whatever it is um, whether it's like you know you need to go for a walk you need to get some fresh air drink some water yeah. distract yourself sometimes I sit down if I'm super stressed deep breathing's not working I need to relax I make a cup of tea and I watch some stand-up comedians and have a laugh. Yeah. So do something like, you enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. relaxing. Yeah. Relaxing, not, yeah, not overstimulating. Yeah, come back to that, whatever the, the the issue was or whether it's an assignment, whatever it is, 
Come yeah. back to it. Give yourself half an hour break. Come back. That's it. Okay, so um, we've covered bullying. What would be the main three things, or however many things you would tell a year nine student um, how to deal with bullying? Mm, ask for help. Ask for help. You're not being a narc. Not or being a narc. Like, you know. What about what about facing it head on without retaliating? How would you mm. how would you do that? It's an interesting question for yourself because yeah. because I I feel that at school you you may have not done done it like that. No, definitely not. Um, how would you tell young Year Nine Brittany to 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 tackle it head on? I think believe in yourself. Believe that you're worth standing up for. Um, like you you deserve to be to stand up for yourself. Um, it's not bullying to, st to defend yourself. Now I'm not saying pull out, you know, start throwing punches or anything and, or start bullying back. But if someone comes up to you and, you know, whether it's something little of, of oh my gosh, you look stupid, blah, 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 whatever it is, you know, there, there is absolutely no, nothing wrong with you standing there and going, well, that's not really very kind. Don't, please don't talk to me like that. I don't like it when you do that. Yeah. I don't like that. Let's like, stop it. I'm the same. I'm the same. I said I said that to when I was a kid. Mm. I did that, and that's what I'm preaching to the kids now. Yeah. If you tackle it head on, don't don't fuel the fire. Yeah. Don't react, and mm. yeah, just say to them how you feel. Yeah. And then from there, it's it's their decision to to like oh, they feel bad about that. Yeah. I'm going to continue doing it, and if they do, that's when you ask for help. Help. Yeah. I think as well, like sometimes it sounds silly, but sometimes people don't actually realize that it's hurting yeah. your feelings. Maybe yeah. it, like whether it's that's the way people have spoken to them. Some people are just the really banter. different. Like, there's a fine line between yeah. banter and bullying. Sometimes people yeah. are just, they're trying to reach out to you and they've done it poorly. And, yeah. um, you know, a lot of the time, I mean, I don't know the statistics, but I have heard that a lot of the time when people bully, it's because it's happened to them and they don't want to become the victim again. But you know, when you pull that back to, hey, I don't, I really don't like that. Please don't talk to me like that. Like that actually really hurts my feelings, makes me feel like rubbish. Sometimes it's like it clicks. It for clicks them. for them. Yeah. I was like, oh yeah, I hated it too. Okay, you know, and like, yeah. It's... Yeah. As you get older, that that hits home harder um, for people that are still doing it. And mm. the thing is, in reality, they're still bullying as you get older. And in the workplace, yeah. in, the, in the you know the football field and all that stuff, mm -hmm. in the locker room, I mean, yeah, um, I mean, taunting and excluding. And my friend, I had a conversation with him the other day. His girlfriend, sorry, his wife actually, um, she's um, getting bullied in the workplace mm. because uh, there was some change up in the office. There was a, and one of the employees um, thinks, one of the bosses thinks that she's sleeping with. The employee, and there's all yeah. this drama, and you know, she got made redundant, yeah. and you know, there's all this drama. Like you have to, you know, you, you get you, you get prepared for that at school. Yeah. I feel because it it is worse in the adult life, and that's where like it's stress, anxiety, and even suicide comes in yeah. because they're like, wow, it's even worse in the real world. I don't want to do that. That's yeah. scary. So how would you deal with that as going into adulthood? adulthood? I definitely, I had it in one particular job um, where I was bullied quite, I didn't realise that it was bullying until it hit a real nasty spot. Um, a male colleague was being quite disgusting, um, made me really uncomfortable, but I just thought I was being... I've, I was always told growing up by everyone, oh, you're just too sensitive. So when I, I started to learn not to get up, like, I would get upset, but I would internalize it. So I wouldn't tell anyone that I was upset because it was just like, oh, they're going to tell me that I'm just being too sensitive. Yeah. Until eventually it hit a point where I couldn't go to work anymore without having panic attacks and I was crying. And um, eventually I went to my boss and I was just like, look, this is what's been happening, this is what's been said, and some of it was being said through Facebook Messenger, I was getting sent these horrible messages, so I just kind of showed them to the boss, and I was like, look, I'm not, um, I'm just not sure what to do anymore, and he was just like, okay, we don't accept this behaviour here, and kind of 
you know, it got pulled into line, but I still had to work with that person and trying to keep that professional relationship after you know that the boss has sat them down and spoken to them about it and they know it's you who's made the complaint. Um, That's where you just got to keep your head up. Yeah. You just be like, hey. That was, yeah, really <coughs> difficult, but I, I did and I stuck it out and I actually left that job because I got offered a job that I really wanted. So it was really nice to kind of go on to that and and move on after. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was, it was horrible. Um, I think you just know who your good friends are, know who you can trust and tell people, well, if you're ever in doubt, if someone's making you uncomfortable, trust your gut. Like, yeah. It's okay to be, to admit that you're feeling uncomfortable and sometimes that person just again doesn't realize what they're doing like once you point it out so most of the time people are really quite horrified that they've made you feel that way yeah. or you know they feel quite embarrassed as well as you know and most of the time people it's not intentional but it doesn't mean that the behavior doesn't need to be corrected you know just going oh they didn't mean it that way all the time well then that behavior is just going to keep happening sometimes it needs to be confronted and That's it. That's it. yeah um okay so Going on with that, um, so winding it back to the school now, because mm. this is this is going to be a valuable piece of uh, media for anyone really. Um, what would what would your three things be for a middle school kid to, to go forward with to take away from this? Um, ask for help. Yep. Be number one. Um, oh gosh. Be kind to yourself um, and you know if you make mistakes or you say something and you've upset someone or you realize you've been unintentionally been the bully like try your best to do better but forgive yourself as well like don't beat yourself up over it it's all about trying um, and you're only still learning as well yeah you still yeah. like we're all still learning that's what yeah. life is you know yeah. um, and or the third thing would be, um, I don't know. Just be a good person. Just be, yeah. yeah. Work hard and be kind. Yeah. Now there's one thing I do at the end of everything, every time I do this, is we play the 2000 questions game. Oh. So you have to give me a number between one and 2000. Okay. And I'm gonna ask you that question. All right. 1,800. And two. Why did you choose that number? I don't know. Just picked random uh -huh. numbers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what lesson to this day have you still not learned? Oh. Good, good, good timing. Jeez. This is one like kind of calling yourself out. Yeah. Um. For me, it's for me, it's procrastination. I'm still, still haven't learned how to, to deal with it yeah. properly. I know how to, but yeah. actually doing it sometimes. See, I think just on that, I've learned, cause I've, I've, been, I'm always, I've been terrible for procrastination, but I realized now it's cause um, I procrastinate when I'm stressed. So when I start to procrastinate, it's like my emotional, defense mechanism it's like well that's stressing me out so i'm not going to deal with it just yeah. gonna ignore it so i've learned to like dial back okay why am i procrastinating have i taken on too much let's do it one task at a time but i know everyone does it for different reasons um geez one lesson that i'm still trying to learn um i'm still trying to teach myself that it's okay to make mistakes i think um i'm a perfectionist in the way of how other people see me in like emotionally you know if someone tells me I've hurt their feelings and sometimes like I'm getting a lot better at it but I still am so devastated by it because I, I want to Sorry. treat everyone perfectly all the time which yeah. I'm human I can't yeah. so I think learning to be kind to myself in those yeah you should you shouldn't be out to impress everybody yeah because yeah. you're not going to and it's yeah, so I think 
and that comes back to school like yeah. what you said at the very start you know you're not there to, to, to please everybody you're not yeah. going to please everybody and I guess yeah that's the life lesson and I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with that too I I'm still trying to you know make sure that I'm good with everybody and mm. even with friends that I haven't spoken to in a while or they haven't spoken to me I get stressed that they're going to one day and they have they come out and say hey um, it would be nice to hear from you every now and then. Yeah. And I'm like, it's a two-way two, street. Yeah, I've had that. Um, and um, But the real friends are the ones that, you know, um, two to three months, they know that you're going to go quiet or yeah. they, they, they they come back and then we're like, oh, hey, man, you're mm. doing well. You're doing well. I hope, you, hope everything's great. Yeah. And they're, I, they're not, they're not going to cause up yeah. a stink about it. So I've definitely learned that, learning that. And it's sometimes it's okay to let those friendships go. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it may not be forever either. Yeah, sometimes you, know? you just, your health has to come first and it's not selfish, it's it's just if you, necessity. If you can't stay healthy yourself, you can't please anyone else no. after that. Yeah. Okay, one more thing from you Yeah. before we go. One piece of advice for anyone about anything, what would it be? You don't make friends with Sally. You don't make friends with Sally? <laughs> um, no, I just... I think my really big thing, and I've said it so many times, but no matter who you are, where you are, what age you are, you know, it's okay to ask for help. Like, it's actually really important to ask for help. And I think, like, opening up about your struggles, whether it's a situational thing happening with you, whether it's mental health, physical health, whatever it is, like, Ask for help. Let let pe- people want to help you. They love you. They want to help you. And you, like, taking time out to get better is okay. Like, I didn't want... To, I had to leave my job last year. I ended up in hospital because I worked for so many years. Uh, well, for many reasons. But I think a large part of it was when I was so emotionally unwell, still trying to force myself to be a youth worker and felt like I had to look after everyone else and learning that... It was actually okay to go. Hey, I'm I'm really not doing well, yeah. and then and I had to I had to leave my job. So I spent two months in hospital, and like I wish I'd kind of learnt that earlier because I could have, I think, prevented that level of sickness. But at the same time, I've learned so much from that, and I'm learning, you know, in order to be who I want to be, I first got to look after holistically every part of me it's not just about eating well or exercising it's yeah. also how am i doing emotionally how am i doing mentally am i sleeping well am i <laughs> you know am i feeling run down all the time all those different things yeah i think thank you very much for coming in thanks for having me <laughs> good chat good chat <laughs> see you later bye